I want to talk about bravery today and I guess unpack what it means to be brave because I think that's I think out of all of the life experiences that is the one that we regular people dread the most having to be brave but that's also probably the most rewarding one like after you're you're brave even if it's a just a, in a small way man very few things feel better than that than having been brave and so let's just get right into it, man. Let's talk about um, how are you defining bravery to start? And then we'll get into some of the things that you, you put in your book. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, my definition of bravery may be a little bit different to some people's definition of bravery. Um, huh. I, I'll, I'll start with a story. So uh, many years ago, I was in a, uh, let's call it a spiritual retreat for depression and anxiety. Um, and it was a seven day event. And, uh, you know, I was in a pretty bad place. Um, and there were maybe 10 or 15 of us. Um, and there was a guy there who looked very, very scary, right? He, he just looked scary. Sorry, but he did. Um, and it, it turns out that he ended up being a Navy SEAL. Um, and at the end of the, of, the, of the retreat, he turns around to everyone and he says, people think that I am brave because of my job. But the truth is that the true act of bravery is what is happening inside this room, mm -hmm. is what is happening when we share our pain and when we share our truth. And the moment he said that, he didn't seem quite so scary to me. And also, I never forgot it. And, and, and I share that before I explain my definition of bravery, because it came from that Navy SEAL's words. So my definition of bravery is to speak our truth. My definition of bravery is to share our pain. My definition of bravery is to stand in our power. And it all came from that one day when that Navy SEAL truly did change my life because he made me realize that when we are vulnerable and when we speak our truth, whatever that truth may be, maybe we need to leave a relationship. Maybe we need to ask for a raise. Maybe we need to go to rehab. Maybe we need to accept that we're alcoholics. When we speak our truth, everything changes. And sometimes people say to me, Leon, what's the difference between bravery and courage? Your book is called Go Be Brave. Do you talk about courage? And yes, of course I do. And again, this is my definition of courage. Bravery, remember, is speaking your truth. And courage is taking action. It's literally that simple. You start by speaking your truth and then you take action on that truth. Sometimes I go to schools and I give speeches and I'll get kids to stand up and tell me what they want to be in life, right? That's their truth. And they'll say to me, oh, I want to be a scientist. And I say to them, well, that's great. But do you think you're going to become a scientist if you never take any action? Do you think you're going to become a scientist if you never read a book about science? Do you think you're going to become a scientist if you never um, watch a TikTok video about how to become a scientist? And they get it. They get it. Courage is taking action. Bravery is speaking your truth. I love that. Um, and this is going to get a little meta, but to even get into that retreat for depression and anxiety, um, Clearly, you had to have some courage and you had to be brave and be willing to be vulnerable and be willing to speak your truth. And just kind of knowing a little bit more about your story than maybe the average listener or watcher of this episode, I can think back to several moments where you exhibited some degree of bravery. So I'm just curious, what's your earliest memory of bravery as you define it? What was happening? What did you overcome? When, how did you speak your truth? And how did it go? That's a beautiful question. You read my mind. Um, so look, when I was a kid, 
I was brutally bullied for many years, not just at school, not just by kids, but by adults too. And I never told anyone. I never told anyone what I was feeling. I never told anyone what I was going through. I just went through it. And slowly, slowly, it started to break me. Slowly, slowly, it started to break my spirit. And um, it reached a point where I, I had to do something about it. So the first act of bravery, true bravery that I remember, and I'm not saying this was necessarily conscious, right? But the first act of true bravery, I was about 15 years old. I mm -hmm. walked into my mother's room. I remember this like it was yesterday. And I just started crying my eyes out. And I started saying to her all of the things that had been happening for years um, and that I needed to move school. She needed to take me out of this school and move me to a new school. I spoke my truth. I didn't know how she was going to react. I mean, maybe she was going to be like, oh, don't worry, nothing's happening, just stay in school. Luckily, she didn't do that. So I spoke my truth. She took me out of the school, put me into a new school, and it wasn't all hunky-dory per se, but it was a lot better. Um, that was the first moment that I remember speaking my truth and, and being brave. Um, mm. and, and the action that was taken, not just by me, but by my mother, was to move me from that school to a different school. The courage. So this, is, this may seem unrelated, but maybe it won't be, I don't know. But for parents listening to this podcast who may be experiencing the same thing with their kid, what was it about this other school that, that um, caused you to experience less bullying than you did at the previous school? So I know you didn't go to like, did you go to public schools? And No, no, I went to yeah. private school. Um, I, I, I will say the first school I went to was an English school. Okay. And um, they, the teachers were not particularly pleasant. Um, and it was a little bit rougher than the second school. The second school was actually an American school. So the teachers mm -hmm. were much kinder. They were much more, they much more understood about emotions and, 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 and how to kind of like, get a kid who was sensitive to show up. Um, mm. So I think that, that, that was the big thing. And again, it wasn't a perfect like switch. Like it didn't immediately go from the English school to the American school and everything worked itself out, but it was a process and it was just much better. It was gentler, gentler. I think the word gentler is a, is a, is a better way of describing it. Mm. Beautiful. So you also talk about this concept of being yourself right? And you and I are friends, like we've hung out, just, you know, we've had dinners and lunches and whatnot. And I've also seen your Netflix specials. And it's kind of like you're a different person when you're in those Netflix, you're like, you know, when you're when you're having to go up to people and ask them to help you, you know, fill, fill up your tank with gas and feed you and put you up for the night. That's a more sort of extroverted version of you. And then when we hang out, it's more of an introverted version of you that I'm experiencing. So when did you feel like you were, you were living your, 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 your being yourself? And which, which one of those versions would you say is, is, most, um, is, 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 the, is the most accurate in, in terms of who you truly are? It's a great question. I mean, look, I am an introvert. And people that meet me in real life are often like what like where's the time <laughs> Where, where's this guy right. that's running around the world that like is going you know to having all these experiences and is full mm. of life and blah 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 uh well, what happened to him where, where is he um and i'm like well i'm actually just uh, i'm introverted so you know when i'm on screen i can be an extrovert and in life at times i can be an extrovert but generally, I'm pretty quiet, pretty, you know, quiet. You know this, and my friends know this. Um, so I'd say they're both me, but the version of me that is more me on a daily level is the version that you meet when we go and have dinner, right? Mm -hmm. Quieter. Um, so they're both me, but uh, more me is the introverted me. So what's the correlation between being yourself and speaking your truth? So that's a great question. I'd say the correlation 
is that when you speak your truth, you are mirroring what is going inside, on inside, on the outside, right? Like if mm -hmm. I speak my truth to you, then the outside and the inside is being mirrored, yeah? And if I'm speaking my not truth to you, then there is no mirroring, and therefore I am not being my true self. It doesn't mean... You're, that, yeah, yeah, you're straining, and people can sense the strain. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't mean that you always have to go up to everyone you ever meet and be mm -hmm. your full self and speak 100% truth at all times. That's probably not going to end well, right? <laughs> um, but it does right. mean, yeah, with a select few people, and as much as you can, mirror the outside, your outside words with your inside feelings. Yeah, because I'm the same way, man. I mean, I'm, I'm more of an introvert, you know, but I've been able to get on stage and host events and mm. be extroverted. But mm. what I'm hearing and what I'm taking away from this is when you're with someone who you feel like you can be yourself with, you, 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 you give yourself permission to be introverted because that's how you would be ordinarily. You don't have right. to feel like you got to be on all the time. And those are really the best friendships and maybe the deepest friendships are the ones where you can be a little bit sad sometimes. You could be a little bit vulnerable sometimes. You could be a little bit, you know, um, just upset even sometimes. And I, I tell friends because I have a lot of friends and you probably have a lot of friends like this too, but who are coaches and who help people you know, get through these times. And I have to tell them, I say, look, I get everything is connected. I get that everything is working for me, but I just want to, I just want to hear myself vent right now and just, you know, and just talk about this thing that didn't go my way. Cause it's just, I don't know. I just need to have that, that outlet. And then we'll get back to, you know, everything's happening perfectly and <laughs> the whole silver lining aspect of it. You know what? That's really interesting because sometimes people can be blinded by the light. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? It's like not uh, your name is light. I don't mean anyone would be blinded by you, but people can be <laughs> blinded by the light and they don't, they don't open up to their own feelings of sadness, of depression, of this. It's like, you know, this It's a spiritual bypass, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone is always, not anyone is always going to be, fully 100% kind, fully 100% present, fully 100% in a good place. There are moments where we need to let the darkness out, right? And, 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 and I think that's a really important piece. And I think that's why some people maybe look at self-help and are like, oh, it's just all light and blah, 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 blah. No, it's, don't they call it toxic positivity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yes, be positive, but sometimes, bad things happen and you have to accept that sometimes you get angry sometimes you want to i don't know throw something or whatever you know don't ever harm anyone but let out the anger and that's actually interesting i i have a piece in the book about getting mad i say mm -hmm. get mad get angry don't harm someone don't don't scream at someone but in the privacy of your own house in the privacy of your own journal get mad and let it out and i promise you if you and that's an act of bravery in itself and i promise you if you do that you get to a place where you can be a better friend a better husband a better wife uh you know a better employee a better boss because you've let out the rage healthily mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest things that i tell people just get angry yeah that. learn how to learn how to channel it Learn how to channel it. And so yes. speaking of that, that story in that chapter, you talked about the, you know, giving the talk in, in prison. Can you just give us a synopsis of what happened when that inmate we thought hated you <laughs> came up on stage? Oh, wow. That was a, that was a, that was a crazy day. So yes, I do speeches. Um, I, I, I do a lot of speeches on kindness and now clearly I've started doing speeches on bravery. So that <laughs> the speech that I was giving at this maximum security in San Diego uh, was about kindness. And I was mm -hmm. trying to inspire people to um, come up on stage and share their magic, right? And there was this one guy who looked scarier than the Navy SEAL. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I'm talking about a maximum security prison. You know, think about all the worst things that happen in society. 
that those were the people who were sitting in front of me, right? And there was this one kid, this one guy who I asked to come on stage and he just, I kind of thought maybe I shouldn't have let this guy come up on stage at some point, but I, whatever, it was too late. He came up on stage and then he started rapping and it was beautiful. Mm. It was absolutely beautiful. The light inside him was shining so radiantly. It was a it was a never to be forgotten moment that shows that if we can touch our own magnificence and share it with the world, it changes lives. I have never forgotten that moment. I mm. gave him a hug. He gave me a hug. It was so beautiful. And unfortunately for this fellow, I, I, I mean, I don't know what he had done, but it, it, it seemed that he was going to be there for a very long time, you know. And in that moment, he connected to his magic. And had he connected to his magic earlier in his life, had he had people who, safe people who he could speak to, safe people who he could share with, there's a very big chance he wouldn't have been in there. Mm. Um, it was such a profound moment for me. Mm. So going back a little bit, you, you, you start the book with this, uh, this contract you want the reader to agree to, which is to practice becoming themselves. And what are some of the um, real world metrics that one can look at just in their day-to-day -day life and just to tell, to give them the feedback, hey, I'm be becoming more and more of myself at work, at home, in the relationship with myself. I mean, look, it's really a real world, real world metrics. I, I would say it starts off with a feeling, mm -hmm. you know, like if I am a mechanic, but I know that I really want to be a poet and that's my life, or I want to be a writer, but I am being a mechanic, I am clearly not being myself. I understand there may be reasons why that person is a mechanic and needs to look after his family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, you just know inside whether you are actually doing and being the person that you are meant to be. It's like a, it's like a felt sensation. You know that you've met people who, who are clearly in the flow, right? And they are doing what they're supposed to do. And then mm -hmm. you've met people who are not in the flow. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to real world metrics, I would say get a journal, write in that journal what it is that you truly, truly want. Everything that you really, really want. And this is the truth diary exercise, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's called the truth diary. You write exactly what it is you want. And if you don't have any of those things, there's a very severe problem. If you do have those things, then you are closer to the, to the, to the tipping point of, of, of being who you truly are. What is it about the power of writing it down that will encourage or inspire action? I think when you write something down, first of all, it's tangible. Mm -hmm. So you have a thought and then you write that thought down and the thought becomes real. It's actually out into the world on a piece of paper. And I think that's a really important, like, uh, let's call it a hack. So sometimes what happens to me is I'll think of something and until it's written down, it's not real. Of course it is real because I thought it, but it's not super real until it's actually written. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really important thing. And that, and, that, and that real world metric is get a piece of paper. If anyone's listening now, get a piece of paper at the end of this podcast and write down what you really want. Not what society wants you to have, not what your parents want you to have, what you want. In the privacy of your own journal, write it down. And I promise you, if you're doing it congruently, emotionally, you will, the answers will be there. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying you write it down and all of a sudden it comes, mm -hmm. but at least you'll know what it is that you're meant to to be doing to be feeling it's there you can look at it every morning and it becomes real a thought is fleeting 
You write it down, it becomes real. So let's say they write it down, right? Then what? Do you quit your job? Do you just start taking little baby steps? Yeah. So remember, bravery is speaking your truth. Mm -hmm. So if you start by writing it down, you've started the process of speaking your truth, right? You then have to take it to the next level of sharing it with another human being. Small little baby steps of action. Or you can go nuts, burn your ships, <laughs> what the conquistadors did they burnt their ships so they had no choice but to keep moving forward and you just go for it like i didn't become a netflix host or write books or or create my um uh speeches just like that it really started when i spoke to my mother at 15 years old the first step was speaking my truth the second step was the courage for my mother and for me to move schools. And then yeah. small little baby steps got me to where I am. Mm -hmm. Small little baby steps. You start by speaking your truth. Most people never speak their truth. They don't. They don't do it. And if you don't speak your truth, you don't share your pain, you will never get the chance to stand in your power. That's the truth. And I think when people hear, you know, burning the boats as a concept, we think about it in an extreme way. Like I, I should just quit the job. So then I have no choice, but that you don't have to do that. I think what you're talking about, which is baby steps, right? As long as you feel like you're moving forward, then you're moving in the right. That's, that's a way of burning the boats because, because you're sacrificing something. You're sacrificing the time and attention you may be putting, instead of reading that book on fashion, you're on Instagram or you're, you know, watching a Netflix show or something like that. And when you find yourself getting sort of stuck or using a lot of excuses not to move forward, a way of burning the boats that I've used before that I found to be very effective is I put something on the line. So I sent a buddy of mine, I was writing my first book and I was just not really being as proactive with it as I, as I knew I could have been. And so I sent a buddy of mine a check for $4,000 and I said, if I don't finish the manuscript by this date, which was like three months from that point, you have to cash this check and spend it on something that has nothing to do with me. And then once I, once that was out there in the universe, all of my excuses went away because there was no way I was going to lose that $4,000. I couldn't afford to lose the $4,000. So I had to find the time and all the time that I didn't think I had all of a sudden freed up. Do you know what? I'm so glad you shared that story with the $4,000. I have never heard anyone else do that. I do that. I'm telling you, I give my credit, I give my credit cards to people, close people, and I say, look, if I don't do this, you have my permission to spend $1,000 on my credit card. Mm. And that's it. I actually had a, I had a, I had a coach, and, and, and um, I ended up giving her my credit card number, yeah, and I said, if I don't, it was for my new speech. If I don't send you 15 slides. By no excuses. No excuses. <laughs> you can spend $2,000 and give it to a charity. Do whatever you want with it. And what happened? I did it. Of course. I did it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's a, a beautiful really... way. Yeah. yeah. And even with something a little more intangible, right? Like you, you were wanting to... I think navigate your mental health challenges and just kind of get to the other side of that a lot quicker. And instead of doing the sort of conventional way, you decided to go out into the wild for 10 days by yourself, right? As a way of just kind of sitting with it and feeling into it and all of that. And that, that brings us to another part of the book where you talk about how, you know, rest is one way of dealing with stress, but a more effective way could be going into nature. So let's talk about, let's talk about that. Let's talk about nature and, and how, that relationship can help you become more of yourself and, and, and deal with the things that you're going through right now. So one of the concepts of the, of the book is to become more human. What does that mean? What's he talking about? Become more human. I'm human. What I mean is to become more connected to the essence of our humanity, right? I was sitting uh, in, a, in a field um, a few years back. And I remember a field, like a foresty area with a field. And mm. I remember thinking to myself, what a beautiful moment this is. I am drenched in nature. There is no phone. 
There is no computer. There is no Instagram. There is nothing. And I remembered feeling this is how a human being 50,000 years ago would have felt. Exactly like this. And we have forgotten over years, hundreds of years, thousands of years of the essence of our own humanity. And the best way to get there is to go into nature. For some reason, I wake up really early these days. I'm always up by like 6 a.m. Mm. And I look out the window and the sun is rising. And the, the feeling I get is one of being fully embraced by nature and fully connected to myself and everything. I can't get that in front of the television screen. I can't get that in front of my phone. I get that by being in this like primal state of nature, this primal state of what is, yet we have lost connection to what is because we are connected to our phones, we are connected to our computers, we are connected to the chaos that is causing inner chaos. And the way to get rid of that chaos is to go into nature, whether it's the ocean, whether it's a forest, whether it's a lake, and just sit in it mm -hmm. and be consumed by it, which is mm -hmm. our natural state. I'm in Mexico City right now, um, and very few people have a car here, right, in the area that I'm, I'm living in, which is like right in the middle of the city. So going for a hike, for instance, would be like, you know, an hour long thing just to get there and you haven't even hiked yet. But there is this park right around the corner from my place. And within that park, there's an open area where there's just direct sunlight for most of the day. And I try to get over there for about 20 minutes a day. And I have to say that has been the most profound new addition to my daily routine that I've done in a long time, since I started meditating probably 20 something years ago, was to go just sit in the sun. And so I think when people hear nature, they imagine trees and forests, but it could just be something as simple as sun or something as simple as, you know, water. And if you can't get to the ocean because you live somewhere that's a far from the ocean, maybe you take a bath and just sitting in a bathtub could be a good substitute for, you know, making sure you have some contact, some exposure with nature every day because it's meditative as well and it'll give you insights into those next steps that you're referring to and one of the most beautiful things you can do is you can find a park exactly as you said and mm -hmm. literally just lie down on the grass mm -hmm. and sit there for 20 minutes and it grounds you it connects you it's a it's beautiful it's like a it's like a heart-centered grounding exercise that anyone can do i mean there's a park somewhere in the world everywhere mm -hmm. so i've read i've read of you know your previous books and uh this one is different in the way that you formatted it it's almost like these the scattering of thoughts and even the indentation of the various lines are different from obviously conventional books, even from your previous books. And I'm just wondering what your, what your process was or what your thinking was around how you chose to, to lay this book out and why you chose that format as opposed to a more conventional format. So it, it, the book Go Be Kind, which is the previous mm -hmm. book, is actually right. similar to Go Be Brave, right? The other books, you're absolutely right. There is a, it's just a normal, it's a normal book. But for example, with Go Be Kind, people would always say to me, oh, Leon, it's okay for you to travel around the world and quit your job and go on these kindness adventures. I can't do that. I've got a job, etc." I'm like, I get it. <laughs> so what I did was I did Go Be Kind as an adventure book of kindness. So you could go and have your own kindness diaries experience. Yeah. And then with Go Be Brave, it's something similar. It's a journal where you get to do 24 adventures well 24 and three quarter adventures mm -hmm. where you actually immerse yourself and experientially live bravery and show and make your, your yourself feel 
the act of being brave. It's kind of like an experiential journey. It's mm. not just a, a book that you read. It's a book that you do. And why is that important to, to take this action as you're reading through the book, as opposed to just understanding it conceptually? Because understanding conceptually and understanding feelingly are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. In order to change, one has to feel. Yeah. And you can feel when you read a book, of course. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that my book is the only book that you feel, but this book is like an experiential journey into the heart of who you are, into the heart of how you experience the world. And I've experienced many journeys, many travels, and they stay with me. It's a felt experience that stays with me. And that's the purpose of the book, to give you a felt experience of being brave, a felt experience of being angry and sharing that anger um, wisely. It's a felt experience. Um, Maya Angelou once said, people don't remember what you say to them. They remember how you make them feel. And that's the purpose of this book, to make people feel their own magnificence. So when you were writing this book, obviously, like, you would think anyone would be game to be more brave, be more kind. But who, who specifically were you writing this book for? Like, who did you have in mind? Was it the people in the jails you talked to? Was it, you know, people who were just scared all the time? Do you know what? That's a great question. And people always say to me, Leon, you need to write a book for a certain category of people, <laughs> 18 to 35, 41 to 68, 105 to 112, <laughs> whatever, right? I wrote this for everyone. I'm sorry, but I did. Now, you know, you know can a seven-year-old read it? Maybe, yeah. Can a 12-year-old read it? Absolutely. Can a 99-year-old read it? 100%. I wrote it for everyone. Because if I'm not mistaken, everyone is human. And if uh -huh. I'm also not mistaken, everyone has feelings. And if I'm also not mistaken, everyone wants to live as magnificent a life as they possibly can. And if that's the case, then I wrote this book for everyone. I'm going to push back a little bit, okay? I agree that it's applicable to everyone. But the way you wrote it, there's a lot of like disclaimers, like I know you're gonna think this is da da da, but just try it. So you're it's that someone who may be apprehensive to buy into some of these these concepts because maybe this is the first time they're coming across this kind of information and they have to kind of be sold on it a little bit. Okay, all right, I, I get your point. So ultimately, if you if you're not aware of your own human frailties, right? and there's mm -hmm. no awareness going on, then you're not going to read this book because you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, I'm not interested. If you are willing to see that there's another way to live, if you're willing to kind of be like, mm, okay, I maybe it's time I showed some vulnerability, vulnerability. If you're willing to be like, you know, I've been doing kind of the wrong things for a while. Maybe there's an opportunity to do some different things. This book is for you. Um, if, you know, you want to live your greatest life yeah then this is a book for you if you are inspired by going inwards and going inside and finding answers that will enable you to live more profoundly then this book is for you um there's a steve jobs clip that you know makes the rounds on social media from time to time and he says that every morning he would stare at himself in the mirror before work and he would ask himself the question, do I feel like doing whatever I'm going to be doing today, whatever's on my, my agenda? And he says, if the answer is no too many days in a row, then that's his internal sign to switch it up. And I would say that, you know, yes, the book applies to everybody. But if you are in that situation where you're saying no too many days in a row, then this book is really, really not just informative, but useful from an experiential uh, point of view, because you do walk people through 
you know, these 24 and three quarter exercises for being brave. And, um, you know, just like a lot of books in the self-help category, if you literally did everything that is being prescribed in the book, you would be a changed person by the end of that book. But obviously, a lot of times people don't. They get excited, they read the book, they put it down, and they don't go back to it. And I've done that. I've done that, you know, tons of books that I started and never really finished. And so if that happens, and I know you probably don't want to think about it like this, but if, if you, someone could just focus on one of those exercises to just get the ball rolling, which one would you say is the most foundational principle for being more brave, bring, being braver? Speak your truth. It all starts from there. It all starts from speaking your truth. Mm -hmm. What's your truth? Are you an alcoholic? If you are, do you need to go to AA? I would say yes. Are you in a job that you don't love and you don't want to be in? If you're in a job that you don't love, you don't want to be in, speak your truth. Tell someone. If you live a lie, you will not end up magnificent. That's the truth. So it's simple. It's speak your truth. Whatever that truth is. Mine at 15 was that I was being bullied. I needed to leave school. It was also that I always wanted to travel the world and be a host. And that's what happened because I spoke my truth. Find someone safe and speak your truth. That's the ultimate thing. Share your pain. That's it. I would also say that a close second, because you you're right, you have to speak your truth. And then a close second would be asking for help. You talk about that in the book, you know, about how the kindness diaries help to show you how brave you could be in asking for help. And, um, and I saw another clip on social media, of this karate instructor working with this kid. And um, so one kid was holding this kid's legs. He was like in the plank position. He picked his legs up. So the kid had to move forward with his hands and he's walking on his hands forward. And he just got to the point where he was so exhausted. He couldn't go another step. And the karate instructor goes, okay, so what are you going to do next? Because this happens all the time in life. You have the intention to move forward. You want to move forward. You know that going backwards is not where you want to be, but you can't go. You don't have the strength. What are you going to do next? And then he said, you know, if you were in the gym and you couldn't lift that next rep, what you would have to ask for a spot. You'd have to get help. And so he had two other kids come over and help pick the guy up and give him a spot. And he kept moving forward. So I would say a close second would be asking for help. Do you know what? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, what I would say is when I, when I say speak your truth, I'm not talking about speaking your truth to someone who, who is going to, you know, squash you. I'm talking <laughs> Trivialize about, it, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about someone, speak your truth to someone who will help you. So that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. All right. So one part of the book that really stood out to me, because again, I know you on a personal level, is <laughs> the, the, the part about you talking, you going on Rachel Ray's show. And she was asking you a question about bravery or something like that. And you, you mentioned that, you know, one of the things that you needed more bravery or more courage around, oh no, what is the one thing that's missing in your life? Because you have everything, that's what she said. Let me, let me just say that again. So one other part, from your book that really stood out to me, because I know you on a personal level, is when you went on the Rachel Ray show and she was asking you, she was saying, you know, someone has or seems to have, you know, all their basic needs met plus more, which was a situation you were in. What is, what is something that you would, you would desire? And you said, you said what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. I said, on live television uh -huh. that, I, that I wanted a wife. Right. And so, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. No, so you and I are like in our forties, right? We're accomplished guys, smart, intelligent, all the things. And yet we don't have wives. <laughs> we don't have kids. You've got a dog. Um, how does bravery, and maybe there's no answer for this, but how does bravery relate to that kind of situation because i also would like to have a life partner or is it is it just the the 
you know, modern day, modern day dating dynamics that it has not, nothing to do with bravery. This is bravery about, uh, does bravery relate to this experience at all? And not having something that you want, because you, you wanted to go around the globe on a motorcycle. You did that. You wanted to go from Argentina or, or, or Antarctica to Alaska. and You did that. So what is it about having a wife that we could use the principles of bravery to and, and burn the boats and all the other things, speak our truth to, to fulfill. But uh, uh, isn't that the definition of, a, of, a, of a, a good relationship? All good relationships are speaking truth. All mm -hmm. good relationships are making um, decisions, not just for one, but for two. Relationships are not easy. It's actually easier. It was easier for me to circumnavigate the world than it to is. Be in a relationship. I'm not joking. Than it is to be in a successful relationship. That's the level of madness. It was easier for you to go up to strangers for six months and ask them to put you up for the night and feed you for the day and put gas in your in your motorcycle. Absolutely, because I would have small relationships with them, right? Meaning, like you know, platonic small relationships. I'd meet one person, then I meet another person. When you're in a relationship with someone, your madness. And their madness becomes one big inferno of madness. You're naked. No, yes. Literally and, and, and metaphorically. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the, one of the greatest acts of, of, of bravery, to actually yeah. master that, which is what I'm trying to do somewhat <laughs> unsuccessfully. To master <laughs> that, you're on Bruce Lee level. Right. You can I, I call that, I say relationships are the equalizer. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how many connections you have. It doesn't make it easier to be in a relationship. If anything, it can make it even harder. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it's a, it's a, it's look, like I said, bravery, ultimately to me, speaking your truth. It's mm -hmm. also sharing your pain, but the, the standing in your power, how do two people, I'm no relationship expert, clearly, how do two people get to stand in their power um, simultaneously and everything work out beautifully? I, I don't know. I mean, if anyone knows, let me know. Can we just unpack it a little bit more, though? So what have you learned over these last, since you started the Kindness Diaries, what have you learned about relationships? That they are very difficult. And specifically romantic relationships are extraordinarily challenging. I once read a book where it said that we think that we are normal when we are alone mm -hmm. and that when we get into a relationship with someone, we realize that in fact we are not normal because all of the triggers come up, all of the ego stuff comes up all of the pain comes up and to face that whew, that's not easy to face that not just in relationships but just generally to face our own madness and i don't you know it, it takes a lot of patience for ourselves it takes a lot of patience for the other person it's a tough one you know, and I, I don't, you know, my personal story, and I don't want to go into it here, but it's a tough one, you know, and I know, and you know, and we all know how tough it is. And we get fed a, like a story of romanticism that, oh, you're going to find one person and everything's going to work itself out. You know, within six to nine months, 12 months, the chemicals going on in our brain after meeting someone, they go away. And we're faced with the, with the reality of having to deal with the reality which isn't so simple yeah mm -hmm. would you say that you are closer to having a wife today than you were back when you made that comment on rachel ray's show however many years ago <laughs> did i give you permission to ask me these kind of tough <laughs> questions um wow um i would have to say yes you know i've been through a lot I've, i'm a mm -hmm. wiser i'm uh i'm definitely closer yes I would say the same thing, right? And it's not because I necessarily have someone who I'm thinking about, you know, getting into a long-term marriage with or anything like that. But just as a person, I'm a lot, I take things a lot less personally. And I look, when I reflect back in my track record, that usually 
was the point where things started to go off the rails is when one or both people start taking things personally, not realizing that we're really just dealing with each other's inner child and it's really not personal. And it's, it's an opportunity for us to see ourselves as a team against the problem instead of seeing the other person as the problem. Do you know what? You're absolutely right. And I know that I do take things personally. And people have told me that many times, don't take things personally, like wise people. And I understand it intellectually, but on a felt experience, when I'm in that environment with my partner or whoever it may be, it just all goes out the window. Something happens yeah. internally. It's the inner child. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about yes and no and the importance of saying yes and the importance of saying no. And how do you know when it's the right time to say yes and when it's the right time to say no? We've all said yes when we meant no. And, we, <laughs> and we've all said no when we meant yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of bravery to say yes when we want to say yes but we feel like the other person wants us to say no and it takes a lot of bravery to say no when we want to say yes I've confused myself but I think you know where I'm, where I'm going here right? Yeah. When, to uh, say no when the other person really wants you to say yes yes that's what I mean right mm -hmm. um, and Look, the, the concept of the book, although I define bravery as speaking your truth and sharing your pain, the concept of the book is really about reconnecting to our humanity, mm -hmm. reconnecting to who we are as human beings. And with the advent of the internet, with the advent of TikTok, with the advent of Zoom, with the advent of television, with the advent of all of these things and, and the craziness in the news, we have forgotten who we really are. Everyone wants the same thing ultimately. To be loved, to be seen, and to live magnificently. Everyone, irrespective of color, irrespective of creed, irrespective of money, etc., etc. How do you get there? You get there by connecting to your humanity. Because when you are to the good and the bad of your humanity, because when you are, you are grounded and you know what you are, what you want, where you're going, where you've been. But if we keep being pummeled with, with outside influences, we are not actually being the true essence of our own humanity. It's about go be brave is really about relearning and refeeling how to be a human. I love it because it's so it feels so practical. And again, it's not something that you can really argue against, you know, because we all want to be brave deep down. But we also have these these really important sounding excuses for saying yes to things that we know we don't we have no business, you know, involving ourselves in. Like, um, you know, just as an example, uh, being in a relationship that you've already realize is toxic or some or, or toxic work dynamic and you, and you realize oh my god um, I'm in the middle of this thing I thought it was one thing but turns out it's another thing I've had enough I've done enough of the of the research to see that there are so many red flags but we live together but it's paying me well but my family likes this person but you know and so we have these buts and how how do you overcome those really important sounding excuses to take that leap out of the yes and make it make the yes into the no that it should be or making the no into the yes that it should be if somebody wants you to do something and you know everything inside of your body is contracted around the, the, out, the outcome of that possibility and you know you shouldn't do it i'm going to let you into a little secret you have to promise not to tell anyone Okay. <laughs> I won't say anything. Okay. Good. I can't promise that any of the thousands of listeners won't say okay. anything. The person that wrote Go Be Brave mm -hmm. isn't always brave. <laughs> the person who wrote Go Be Brave doesn't always have courage. Mm -hmm. There is no perfection. 
the difference maybe between the person who wrote Go Be Brave and some is that I have made a conscious decision to commit to kindness, to commit to bravery, to commit to courage to the best of my ability. Mm. There are times where I am aware that I'm not doing it and it doesn't feel good. There are times I'm aware that I do do it. So you have to make a commitment the same way you make a commitment to posting on Instagram or the same way that you make a commitment to your wife or to your kids. You make a commitment to become better. Make a commitment to become better. And I promise you, everything will change. But without that commitment, the chances of you becoming better are nil. Mm -hmm. I think another important point to make um, as someone who's made some what others would consider brave choices in their life, you know, living from a backpack and giving up my apartment and all that stuff, is that with that action is going to come periods of loneliness, periods of repetition, you know, where just kind of you're in the humdrum of it, of the process. Uh, and, and, you know, things aren't going to be as exciting as they may appear on a Netflix show or in a book that we write as a result of these experiences. And so there are lots of these in-between moments where, where someone could look at that and go, well, maybe I made the wrong choice <laughs> because I didn't think it was going to be this. But you have to understand that it, it's a process. And as much as possible, we want to we want to be process oriented, you know, be in the process of it and understand the journey itself is the destination as opposed to you know, always looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yes, and Michael Jordan only became Michael Jordan because he never gave up. He kept on going. He made a commitment and he went through his own process. Otherwise, if Michael Jordan had woken up one morning and been like, oh, you know what? I can't bother to do this anymore. Right? He wouldn't. I got to go to all this practice. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, that, that's the point. He committed. Commit to whatever it is you want in life, but ultimately at the base commit to becoming better mm -hmm. whatever that may be whether it is through bravery whether it is through your eating habits whether it's through exercising commit to it and there are sometimes you'll fail oh oh no i failed well of course you're a human being you will fail but commit is there anything you're going through now that you're having to kind of coach yourself up and be your own cheerleader around this idea of being brave and saying yes and or no to a possibility? Light, you ask me very interesting questions. That put me on the spot. Um, and I, and in my head, I'm thinking to myself, should I just lie to the man or should I just... <laughs> no, you just gave us a whole speech on telling the truth. Well, so I know. Well, I, just, I, I know, but I just told you that I was <laughs> debating whether to lie or to tell the truth. <laughs> And because I'm a committed man to becoming better, I'll tell you the truth. Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> look, you know, I, I, I've spent the past decade making the brand of the kindness guy, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm very proud of what I've done. But at the same time, I am so much more than the kindness guy. The kindness guy is one aspect of who I am. Yeah, people stop me on the street. They stop me in airports. And they're like, the kindness guy, the kindness guy. And that's great. On some level, I've, I've touched lives, and I'm very proud of that. But the kindness guy is only one small part of who I am. And mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why I switch things to talk about bravery, right? So I would say that my truth is, is I'm not sure how long the kindness guy will be with us, right? Because... There's more. The kindest guy has become like this caricature of who I am. I am not just the kindest guy. There's so much more to, to, to me and to my capacity to kind of hopefully inspire than the kindest guy. So can you give us a, a glimpse into the vision that you're seeing so you can kind of put it in ink virtually? And burn my ships. But you basically yeah. just made me burn all my ships. My career has been <laughs> destroyed now. I've destroyed the kindness guy and it's over. Um, That's look, a good thing. Yeah, I guess. Um, to burn my ships? Yes, I will. I'm going to burn my ships right now. Are you ready? Okay. Right? 
I'm I need ready I need to burn my ships. I'm ready. Right. So look, I've told you about this documentary. Uh -huh. um, I'm in the documentary, right? You, you, we, we talked about that. You are in the documentary, yes. Um, and it's about a moment I had a dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be here anymore. And I called my therapist instead after writing a note. And I went to a bookshop and found Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. Mm -hmm. In that book, I read the following sentence. If you reveal God to me, I will follow you anywhere. I had an epiphany and I decided to go to India to find God. And uh, that's the documentary. And that's, that's the truth. That was my truth. And no one knew that. Everyone's going to know it now. And uh, I found God. What is God? I'm not talking about the man in the sky. Although if some people want to believe that, that's fine. I'm talking about the universal energy that lives in everything. And I found it. And I realized I didn't have to go to India to find God. Because it's everywhere. It's right here. I feel it in your eyes. I, I, I see it in the trees outside my house. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my way of letting the kindness guy know that his time he can he can continue to to, to do what he needs to do but i don't want to i don't want to be that anymore mm -hmm. so um, you said when the documentary is done god willing right so clearly there's some things going on in the background that <laughs> that are slowing the process down i'm just curious this will be my last question if someone out there is listening to this and they're thinking, I'm going to make a documentary, what do they need to know <laughs> to, keep, to, to, to bring the thing through to the end, to get it across the, 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 the line? Don't, don't think too much about what it, makes, what it means to make a documentary and just do it. And by the time you realize what it means to make a documentary, it'll, it'll be so far down the line that you'll have no choice but to finish it. <laughs> Burn the boats. <laughs> Burn the boats. Burn the boats. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, look, um, it's always a pleasure getting to speak to you both in person and virtually. And um, I'm super excited about this, this work of art being out in the public for people to be able to use to change their life. And, um, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to call you a friend and look forward to the next time we get to hang out. No worries. When you come back to Venice, let me know. I will for sure. Thank you so much, sir. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.